How's everybody doing? Happy Sunday. Let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. So you know how we do it. I'll just go over some of the videos I've done this week to give people time to fall in. Checking myself on my little YouTube with the health. Looking pretty good. I just need to change my restream screen size, which is something else. Let's see. I don't know if it's because it's good weather, but I am struggling. Struggle streaming. So we'll go over a couple videos I just did this week, then we uh, um jump into it. Uh yeah, uh <laughs> If you got any cybersecurity questions, just throw them in the chat. I appreciate that, man. Thanks, Laddie Bo. Hopefully, I'm center. Pair character line on the side, raising his arms while saying, <laughs> how's it going? Fax is going good, man. I can't complain. Just a little tired. <laughs> I was called. The young guys had me on YouTube to 2 o'clock last night. I'm too old for that. <laughs> I need to go to bed early. But we had a good combo. So let's uh, go over a couple videos, then we'll um, go over the slides. So um, I always put, uh, I call it regular cybersecurity news. I'll go over that. I sent a, about two, uh, two videos out with regular uh, cybersecurity. So this is a first shooter game. Uh, they were showing it actually on YouTube. And in the Description, it had links. If you clicked on one of those links, your computer got hacked, right? <laughs> they were dropping uh, malware and viruses on people's computer uh, using this first uh, first shooter game as a phishing attack. So that's pr actually pretty common. Shout out to YouTube. They do a pretty good job about um, taking links, taking care of malware, virus protections, um, using that on their platform. So they usually don't have a lot of problems on on their youtube what's up peter salute glad you could join me so um let's just say first shooter game tricking the kids thinking they were going to get more power and more play time they clicked on one of those links uh once again their their uh, machines got hacked um novice security uh introduction to cyber security um novice security uh, <laughs> Some of my followers, which were cool, they've been supporting me. They, <laughs> they said sometimes I sound like I'm speaking Japanese because, <laughs> you know, in cybersecurity, once you get into this buzzword, intensive, uh, people that know me or just uh, my little background is I'm actually a professor in real life. Um, I teach at night at a community college. Um, I'm a cybersecurity consultant for a large state agency. And I used to work at DOD for 11 years, so I am tla <laughs> intensive right three letter acronyms I, I can throw those around with the best of them so i'm doing this uh i'm calling it a uh, novice security just to help regular people break down some terms like the last one i did was fishing that was my first one super easy the basics we know fishing is the um the doorway into getting hacked getting ransomware getting malware getting viruses so i just wanted to break it down into a, a super easy term so everybody can um Trying to get a baseline if you want to learn like for every day. What's up, Will? I'm glad you could join me. Um, so yeah, so I'm calling novice security. Uh, I probably go live on I'm hoping Tuesday around three or four and then just uh chop it up about uh viruses, worms, and uh viruses, worm, and malware. It's just kind of the differences and once again, base level, introduction, ABC level. Uh let's try to break down some of these. <laughs> Snuggles. Snuggles picking on me. <laughs> Snuggles was on last night when I was debating the kids. <laughs> we were going at it to like I think I think I went to bed at one. Snuggles. <laughs> oh my gosh, Snuggles. I'm tired. I can't hang out with the kids anymore. They're they're, they're too feisty for me. But once again, novice security, uh, super duper um, basic level. Shout out to Snuggles. She want to learn a little bit about cybersecurity. So uh, and I'm gonna make it a playlist. Um, so once again, just breaking down cybersecurity, the basic stuff. We did phishing. The next one I'm going to do is going to be do uh, virus, malwares, and worms. Super basic level. So 
once again trying to cut through the TLA and, and me working on explaining it at a super low level, right? Now for the advanced people, I got a ton of stuff coming up. Like we're gonna talk a little bit about uh forensics. So we, we have stuff for different levels on this channel. So uh quick one I did for cyber news, cyber attack. People were stealing high priced gases. Um when you looked on a video, it looked like somebody actually put a credit card reader in there. What the credit card did is it bypassed the payment system. So when a guy looked on the the station owner, the fit the gas station owner looked on the video, um, somebody put something in the card reader. Happy Sunday! Somebody put something in the card reader, and they tricked the uh, pump to just uh let anybody who pulled up fill up so the guy looked in there he said 45 cars filled up and he lost like fifteen hundred dollars so um i'm calling that a cyber security attack uh long story short there's car readers connected to laptops uh that's what it looked like he was doing it somehow he tricked the payment um the credit card payment on a pump to stay open and 45 cars filled filled up and uh, he lost eleven hundred dollars and there was another one I did on there was too is somebody had like a van they pulled over the uh, the gas pumps where you actually put the gas in so they had a sliding door in the van I guess they opened it up and sucked a thousand dollars of diesel out of this one gas station so with these super high price uh, gas prices people are stealing gas but we always tell people man the uh, the beast gonna eat man they gonna they gonna figure out a way to to get to work I don't you know that's not right but you know we we know that's what people to do so i just did that video so if you want to go check it out that one's super short um kaspersky is a software security software that was done out of russia uh the united states is banning it you know and a lot of their agencies why they think russia's uh, siphoning off our information and we might be going to uh we're already at cyber war with russia so we might be escalating that to uh so a lot of government agencies which we didn't use kaspersky when the big at dod and other larger agencies but they're banning it from smaller agencies um long story short i talked to a couple they think it's pretty good software but once again it, it, they're banning it so there's a couple videos out there if you want to check them out you bored or two if you want to ask questions in the chat about them I, i'm i'm cool with that too So once again, uh, we're about to get started. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Professor Black Ops, I've been a professor for, appreciate that, <laughs> please subscribe. Um, I've been a professor for a decade. I've done IT for 30 plus years. And I've been in cybersecurity as a security analyst doing federal systems and federal compliance for about 15 years. Um, Department of Defense, uh, IRS. I worked at a lot. Of, I, I asked a good person, so what do I do replace uh, Peter, I, I don't think they're going to siphon information, but if you want to replace it, I mean, you could do uh, Norton. Uh, FireEye's got a uh, for fires, and there's other things you you can you can you you can uh, replace it with. I would just keep it to be honest, Peter. It's it's a high level one. The 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 issue of you getting act off of it is super small peter so to be honest i would keep it shout out to tam uh go check her out uh women in linux is she a mod let me see if you are my tam yeah tam's a mod uh tam are you gonna be on slack or or discord i'm old i forgot already <laughs> i will go check tam out after after mine so i'm sending all my people over to tam my my couple people i have in there i said to tam she's always giving out great knowledge uh we we debate um shout out to her she was handling her own <laughs> yesterday i i thought it was a little different but shout out to tam she always she's a big girl she don't ever need my help if she need me she know where i'm at but she don't need my help she got it can you explain the difference between docker communicators containers or are all those different type of containers i will um hit me up right after the uh once i get finished jam we can break that down um i got a um video on uh docker i'm more of a docker guy actually i got two videos if you look in my uh thing i'll find them jam i got one on docker and, and kubernetes 
um there's a lot more containers tam you can chime in on that one in the chat if you want i'm not trying to make you work either <laughs> but i mean so salute to tam tam does way more with containers than me jam um i do where i work at we do have because i work in a java shop we do have uh are you taking a you taking a break i feel you um i do security checks on uh docker containers um docker's more java it seems like kubernetes uh more orchestration usually for for a dot net shop but we can we can chop that up after like i said uh if if i might see if tim come off a break and see if she can chime in on that container containers like i said she does them a little more than me so today we're talking about forensics data acquisition this is really for beginners just talking about if if a box was hacked or a laptop was hacked how do you copy the data off of that now the cool thing is you gotta have a lot of os's right so there's windows server uh once again containers databases um windows 2019 18 2017 so there's different uh os's and even different drives if you're getting it physically off of a physical drive and how you would connect to it so there's so we're going to kind of go over that at a high level So we're going to talk about digital evidence, staging formats, determine the best way to acquisition method, uh, describe contingency planning for data acquisition, how to use. We're going to talk about some prominent tools in there, uh, how to validate that you're good, different raids, because if you take them off different raids, right? Um, raid one, raid zero, I think it's five and seven. Depending on that, it's going to depend on how you're going to acquire their data, depending on the RAID type. So data in a forensic acquisition tool is used to store the image. Uh, three formats, there's more than that. You can have raw, proprietary format, and advanced forensics format. Right. So as you're reading it off the drive, as you're reading it off the drive for that, right you you can put it in one of these formats remember we're talking specifically forensic right i don't do hey film i said what's up brother michael i'm decent today a little tired i was on i mean i think i was on tams for what four hours yesterday i was on tams for women in linux for four hours uh yesterday then i went on uh Citizen Lou, we were debating for, I think, another couple hours. I got to stay off of YouTube. So, no, shout out to that. Like I said, I think me and, and what well, was on four hours just today, Tim, on your channel? I don't know. That's a long time. So, so we're going to make it possible to write bit stream data, advantages of bit stream, right? We're streaming bits. We're not copying bits one at a time. Faster data transfer and nor miter data read errors on source drive most uh computer forensics tools can read raw file formats disadvantages require as much storage as the original disk or data tools might not collect marginal bias sectors right was it five it was a long time Tim. i'm still tired man i might have to call in to work tomorrow <laughs> i'm hurting man like i said shout out to citizen lou i was on his last night to one i'm like dude i'm too old on that are you off today or are you going on your slack you doing your slack thing today tim what you doing uh making it possible to write bit stream right now we're going bit stream data straight to files fast um the proprietary format uh most have their own forensic tools have their own format so when they're copying them out right they have their own proprietary format to help you do the forensics analysis um once again i'm gonna be uh super transparent is uh we do forensics analysis but we usually outsource that because the goal is to never get hacked so you won't do forensic analysis uh so hopefully we we, we would never use that skill set um i worked like i said i've been in the game for 30 years i've never seen forensic people on site um when we need them the top one uh shout out to gay bay he's work at mandy that's the top one they're like a law firm because the big agencies line up if they ever get hacked from a, a nation state. So usually um, we have a small vendor we use locally, but if we get hacked, because I work for a large uh, state agency that reports to the IRS, we would outsource that to a bigger agencies. Um, one thing I tell people um, from a business perspective is, is if you're gonna do forensics 
and you doing it for a large client, if you miss something and the virus continues to wreak habit or it comes back, you or your company could be financially held responsible, right? Usually people have documentation. So that's one reason I don't, I do forensic at the um, recon level to say, oh, it looks funny. Outsource that to somebody else because I don't want to be responsible for that. Uh, the odds of you getting sued, uh, even as a person or a company, is small, but that actually is a risk out there. So I, I want to put that out there. One of the cop guys, Simon Funk, is an open source acquisition format. He developed it. Design goals provide compressed and uncompressed images, no size restriction for distant images. Provide space on the image file or segment files for metadata. Simple design with extensibility, multiple platform and OSs. External consistency checks for self-authentication. File extension is AFD for segmented image files and AFM for metadata. So part of that metadata is well, who did it, when they did it a lot of times. Um, a lot of times you do pictures in the picture sometimes. It's longitude and latitude for when you actually took the picture. Right. So there's a lot of metadata. Uh, if we're doing phones, right, the phones, even though we're not listening to the phone, the phone call will tell you which towers you you uh, were hitting as you were driving. Right. So they can pull that off and trace. So you see a lot of people <laughs> committing crimes with their phone, even if their phone is off. Right. A lot of times uh, the phone company can still track you um, hitting off of, hitting off of towers. The reason why is. Um, even if your phone's off, you can still locate your deck, locate your phone. So that means your phone is still on low battery power, still uh, hitting those towers. So if you need to find phones, so um, that metadata is still out there, even if your phone's off. That's why they was uh, keeping uh, uh, keeping um, finding uh, murders and stuff. I watched all five hours yesterday. I was at the drum circle at the park with the kids. Home for a bit, then after dinner, hanging out with the fam. <laughs> That's cool. I'm trying to stay off. Uh, uh, let's see. I was on the leak pack till three talking crypto. I'm going to have to go check it out. Um, I didn't, I guess I never seen uh, Le Peep talk about programming, Tam. They usually own some some drama on Le Peep Network sometimes. So I guess I need to check check them out. I, I'll look at them uh, some. I never checked out their um I guess they're a tech part of that. Were you on a, um, um, what's that house thing? Were you on a house? Or were you actually on uh, his network? It was a good show. Were you on the network or were you in the, the house? What's the damn thing they be having? I can't even think of the name of it. I'm sorry. Determine the best acquisition method. Type of acquisition could consider static acquisition or live. Four methods of data collecting is disk to image, disk to disk. Creating a logical disk to disk or disk to data, creating a sparse data file, file or folder. Determine the best method depends on the circumstance and investigation. AFF is open source. So yeah, so depending on uh, is it a is that machine live being used? Did you make a copy of it in quarantine? Uh, what kind of disk is it using inside? Um, we'll tell you which is the best. Uh, Thing you want to do with in acquiring data yeah i'm about to go check out some of those shows like i said i don't follow um i listen to him but i guess i never knew he had a crypto and programming show uh creating a distant image most common methods offer the most flexibility can make more than one copy copies or bit for bit replication of the original drive compatible with many commercial physical forensic tool Disk to disk, when disk to image copy is not possible, tools can adjust the disk geometry configuration, tools of in case and x rays, right? A lot of times you really want to do disk to image, right? So when you hash that file, it's going to match the original, right? That way you know nobody's tampered with your your version of that disk, right? So especially if we, if you, uh, last week we talked about going to court. So you want to you got to show a chain of custody that nobody's messing with those drives logical acquisition or sparse can take several hours used when your time is limited logical acquisition captures only sp specific files interested in a case 
sports acquisition collects fragment or unallocated uh, deleted data for large disks. Uh, email files are in their PST or OST in the RAID server. So a lot of people do backups with PST files for your email because a lot of times uh, you're talking about harassment at work, somebody sending some inappropriate pictures, or you know somebody's just sending some just totally not appropriate in the email. So that's usually always in the case. A lot of times it starts with email, right? Because I always remember when you sign that um, document uh, saying you're going to do work on work computer, really it's their machine, so they can actually look for it anytime quarantine and look for certain things a lot of times too if you look in the uh running programs you have a program like big brother running in the background and actually it's looking for certain things and if if it sees a certain word or a certain image in a picture it's actually going to send it to the security team so so uh once again best acquisition method when making a copy consider the size of the source disk uh lossless compression might be useful uh digital signature for verification we just got to talking about that um you always need signature verification especially if you're going to take it to court working with large drive an alternative could be lossless compression whether you can retain the disk time to perform the acquisition and where the evidence is located right if you in the server room or if you're taking it back to your shop eh, a lot of times too is it could be something damaging in the crime scene. So they're trying to get the information there real quick before stuff gets pushed out of memory. Or if it's a laptop, the battery could be running out. You don't have the right plug. So once again, it depends on where, how, and when, and what you're trying to do. And if you're going to take them to court. Let's see what we got. It was a good show. Yeah, I got to start checking those out, Tim. I don't I don't do talk normally. I pull up because we get in the Atlantic security process. So that oh facts, facts. I try to stay in my lane. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Tam. Anything she's on is gonna be good. Anything Tam's on is gonna be good. We're gonna trap it up. She's gonna top it up. She's very knowledgeable in, in the game. So I'm sure we'd be doing some collabs, and especially when I start doing containers and uh, spinning up uh, stuff in AWS, I'd definitely be reaching out to her because she's done that more than me. Um, I usually do it more from a security compliance standpoint. I think she just does it for a bare metal, let's build it standpoint. So what's up, boys? Uh, it's contingency planning, create a duplicate of your evidence Make at least two images of digital evidence. Um, use different tools. Copy host to protect your disk drive as well. Consider using hardware acquisition tools that can be accessed the drive at the BIOS level. Be, pre be prepared to deal with encrypted drives. Hold disk encryption featuring a bit locker. Make static acquisition more difficult. May require the user provide a decryption key. So if you're in a federal space where I live, all our drives are going to be a bit locker. We're going to do it encrypted because if somebody steals those drives, which is rare, they put them in another server that those drives won't work without the key. Now, you can erase them and use them. But if you erase them, I don't care, right, because the uh, sensitive data is gone. So we're all about that that big locker FIPS 140-2 encryption that's built into uh, the big locker BIOS for federal use, right? And the other part of that, and uh, just at a high level, <laughs> I appreciate it, boys. A lot of times too, when you talk about, um, let me back up a little bit. Let me see. I'm not going the wrong, going the wrong way. Ooh, I'm struggling today. I can't even figure out which way. Which way? Uh, an acquisition. We did that. Oh, trying to get it right. So when you talk about contingency planning here, um, part of contingency planning is we always worried that if uh, the FBI, NSA came in and took our disk for contingency planning and they needed to do because somebody used our server to hack or somebody <laughs> put something that shouldn't have been on our server and they put it in bubble wrap and rolled it off, right? You need to have your DR site set up to be able to continue to do business, right? As far as your contingency plan, right? You wanna 
make sure you have that set up. Um, and obviously, that's the worst case scenario. The odds of that happening is super small, but you want to make sure if that does happen, your business just doesn't stop, right? So you want to sure you have a DRS site or a big copy in that big bit copying your information to a another server there if something happens to your your main stuff you can continue to run in your warm or hot site right especially depending on the level of data some of my con clients have statutory or legal uh, reasons to be up so if they're down more than three days they could get fined by the state government so with that in mind and those uh requirements we got to make sure you know we're up and we, we can handle any downtime uh oh <laughs> shout out i was on there with engineering cannabis cannabis tam after your stream yesterday i am now convinced mentioning 250k as a possible salary not what people want to hear i would tell people if you want to make <laughs> come on engineering cannabis i'm trying to wake up man um, it, 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 that was a very interesting um interesting talk engineering cannabis it, it kind of opened my eyes up to um People get nervous when you really make things possible as far as a big bag about making real money. I mean, obviously, Tim had the data. Tim had had the job wrecks. And, you know, I've seen those jobs. And I don't think she was saying it was for everybody. It's people can come and get it. So you, you're right, engineering cannabis. That, that was a little different. Uh, once again, acquisition tools for Windows make acquiring evidence from suspected drive more convenient, especially in use with hot swappable drives. Our swappable drives are cool because you can take them out, put another one in there, and it's going to rebuild it back. And they're going to talk about it depending on what RAID you're using, right? Disadvantage must protect against acquired data with well-tested right blocking hardware. Tools can't acquire data from this host protected area. Some countries haven't accepted the use of right blocking devices from data acquisition. It's true. I'm doing most of my work in the United States. Once again, I do Fed work, so all that work has to be in the continental US. So uh boot CDs and US drives. A lot of times when you come in, you know, you're doing forensic work, so you're gonna have to boot it off a CD or USB drive. Sometimes people try to destroy this before you get to them, or some just happen. You just need to be able to boot up, you know, and do your job. So many uh WinFE enables you to build a Windows forensic boot CD or DVD. USB drives that connects to drives are mounted as readable. Before booting a suspect uh, computer, connect your target drive, such as USB. After the mini, uh, when FE is booted, you can list all the connected drives and alter your target USB drives to rewrite mode so you can run an acquisition program. Right? So a lot of times you want to, like they said, mount it and read only because a lot of times when you boot up drives hackers have stuff in there like start erasing stuff start doing other things it might be a ransomware virus in there so when you boot up you want to put your drives at read only mode in case something's weird because if it tries to do that you, you will know immediately um about that so that's why they boot up in read only mode yeah engineering cannabis set that, that's interesting uh Acquire data straight out to the Linux boot CD. Um, I've used that a little bit. A lot of times I don't I don't do essay work like that anymore as much. Once again, when I usually when I get on the system, you know, Tam got it up and ready. I can just start working. Right. So as an analyst, you know, I expect all that stuff to be up and running. Linux can access a drive that isn't mounted. Windows and OS newer Linux automatically mounts and access drives. Forensic Linux Live CDs don't access uh, media automatically, which em eliminates the read for your write blocker. Using Linux Live CD distribution contains additional UD, uh, utility. So if you look out there, your Linux Live CDs has a lot of forensic tools on there, so, so you can use them. Um, once again, um, even though it says it doesn't reach out to other media, a lot of times you still want to write block those drives. <laughs> In case anything happens just tell them if they want to walk in and do this shit which can <laughs> the whole time julie allow you to advise them the call is low and facts facts mm. <laughs> i understand get it popping facts facts on that i like that <laughs> trying to get it popping so so using the linux live cd distribution and the forensic live that's on there 
you can configure not to mount or mount as read only or connect to any storage drives well designed in a linux cd these are some of the forensic software that's on there penguin cane def linux Nopix, and sans investigated forensic toolkits i usually use kali and Nopix. that's usually what i use when i'm doing forensic stuff on it kali is actually uh more cyber security but of course but of course uh, forensics is part of cyber security so they have a ton of programs and a, and a, and a, and a ton of different uh, modules on there for, for different things. I think they got a couple hundred on there the last time I looked. Once again, when you uh, on a Linux boot CD, preparing a target drive for acquisition, the current Linux distribution can create a Microsoft FAT and FTS tables. FDisk commands list, create deletes and verifies partition on Linux. MKFS, MS DAO commands, formats a FAT file system from Linux. If you are functioning a Linux computer, follow the starting steps. And we'll pick out a couple of those and learn how to prepare a target drive. So even though it's a Linux uh, CD using Linux for forensics, you can actually work on Windows machines with that, right? which is common. Because a lot of times when you go on site, you're going to be working with various uh, file formats, Linux, Microsoft, uh, databases, just a ton of stuff on there. All right, so we're going to talk about a few uh, Linux commands to help you do a little forensics. <laughs> Great, <laughs> that's funny. Let's have uh, legal leads. Facts with the legal leads. Uh, so uh, when acquiring data with Linux, DD is data dump command. You can read and write from media devices and data formats create for our files that do this uh, computer analysis shortcoming to D, com D commands require more advanced skills than an average user that does not compress uh data dd commands can be combined with split commands to uh, segment out into separate volumes so when you're on linux right we got some command line tools to help you to get there uh to help you get get, get what's on there So once again, you can create an NTFS FAT and FAT3. You can acquire data with a DCLFD in Linux. The DD command is intended as a data management tool. It's not designed for forensic acquisition, even though people use it for that. Uh, acquiring data with the DCLFD command, additional functions, specify hex patterns or text for clearing disk space. You can log errors in an output file for analysis and review. You can use several hashing algorithms to make sure none of the data was changed before you start uh, messing with it. Uh, <clears throat> refer to status to display indicating the progress of the acquisition. Split data acquisition into segment volumes with numeric extensions. Verify acquired data with the original disk or media. Right? So if the host machine or the target machine is too big, why are you copying it? It'll uh, split it up in different segments so you can save it on on multiple mobile drives that are smaller than the server drive right i've seen people do that a ton so man i gotta get some energy i'm hurting Let's see what my people saying utilize the keep it techie free course with linux commands facts facts uh every if you look on my um community tab uh i got a uh, keep it techie stuff on there so definitely <laughs> That was pretty good. I don't care about the feelings we got. Those left were when it I will not sell it short when I know it's possible. Facts, facts. Uh, that was uh, concerning our conversation yesterday, talking about money, uh, how much money you can make in the IT, especially the DevSec, opera, DevSec Ops Arena. Right, 10 specializing. And there's some huge salaries out there once you get those skills. So. My goal is to get uh, AWS certified and start practicing on those. Uh, I think I'm gonna try to be an SRE in 2023. So that's my goal, but I've been struggling lately. I always see you and hear you. <laughs> so, so it's out there. Yes. So once again, um, Tim was just talking about uh, money prospects, job prospects, uh, top at the top of the ladder. Let's get it. Uh, it's out there let's just get the skills to, to make it happen right uh, 
So now we're going to talk about Access Data FTK. It's a popular forensics tool kit used for forensics, designed for viewing evidence disk to disk image, make disk image copies of evidence drives, and a logical pattern physical drive letter level can segment the image uh, file. Evidence drives must have a hardware write blocking. We always talk about that because you don't want to accidentally <laughs> delete some. Or like we talked about, you can run a live CD, which had uh, the Win Mini in to boot, right? So we're just giving you different tool sets. And uh, probably at the end of the summer, when I run this course again, we actually have labs that we're going to start doing. Um, so I'm setting up my lab. So this is my, my next, my last raw, raw lecture by itself. I'm going to start doing labs uh, for AWS and putting those together. So when we do... Um, Introduction to cybersecurity. We asked some AWS labs to build on that stuff to what a security analyst does on an everyday job. Right? This is some of the screenshots of the FTK. You can capture an image of FTK with the light. So it just shows you the evidence tree through the left, custom contents, and the names of the uh, files that should be on there. Let me go back and look at that slide. There's supposed to be some names on there. So, hey, but we we getting through it. Like I said, this is, I just want to touch on uh, forensics as another cybersecurity domain. So if you're interested in cybersecurity, it's just something you're aware of and uh, uh, another um, thing you can study. Facts with the platform engineer. I'm trying to get blockchain $2 million back. I want to be the super outlier in the chart. Facts. I want to be way to the right engineering canon. Um, so once again, let's touch on the FTK. Uh, acquire disk protected area. Use the right blocker. Nine times ten. Any software you want to do, use, you want to use the right blocker because you don't want to accidentally delete stuff, right? So we're going to boot to Windows. Connect evidence to disk to right blocker. Connect target disk to a right blocker. Start FTK image. Create a disk imaging using physical drive option. See the figures on the following slide for more steps. So we're just kind of walking through, like I said, some of the screens of what it looked like when you would do. Um, so here we picking the source drive. This is the machine that got hacked. Uh, please select from the following available drives. You got a USB 2 drive, right? So just gonna make an image of those drives so you can have a copy to work on. You never really work on the original uh, drive. I mean, we keep saying that because you don't want to mess it up. Here we talked about the different raw, the different file formats for your destination. Raw, smart, EO, and that one was that uh, advanced forensic file format. So you can pick the um, appropriate file format that you want to do your analysis on. A lot of times, too, it depends on are there images, Word documents, emails? Uh, do you export some data from a database in a certain format? So depending on what you uh, pick in destination, usually depends on what you're working on. Right, so this is the evidence because <clears throat> chapter three acquisition thumb drive. So usually the evidence item and information tools because you type it up because you're gonna have to talk about what you were looking for, what was in the drive, what was the metadata, what time it was uh, from a um, customer standpoint when the incident happened. Uh, was it harassment? Was it something better? Did somebody steal a laptop and you just got it back? So um, that's what you're going to create in your evidence. And two is if you're going to track it uh, for chain of custody because you're going to take them to court, right? So all that's part of your your, your evidence. So here it talks about you putting in your folder, you name your image file, right? Because if you're looking at emails, each Emails you group together could be for a certain part of the case compared to others. Um, if you're getting stuff from a database, you're getting stuff from a PSP, PST. And two, if you're getting some from a local laptop, right? So, and so two is the how big you think it's going to be. Do you want to encrypt it because um, you think some might get stolen in, in your shop, right? So all that adds up, right? Once again, it's just showing the lap time and the progress. Um, we have huge drives of terabytes of information. So I've seen stuff take 12 hours, so, which is not uncommon when you're talking about a federal very large database. I'll tell them with the LinkedIn info. I, I got to see. I might have to come in. I thought we were LinkedIn. I don't tell them. I don't know. I got to go check that out. I want to be an outlier, too. <laughs> Shout out to Adrian. Uh 
Everybody wants to be that outlier on that chart way to the right. Um, to be honest, I am at a certain level. Of course, I want to be a little further to the right. I won't get some of that investor money. So the credit that investor money, right? So um, well, let's talk about validating. Once you're copying it, right, there's things that could happen at a very low level. Not very often, but you want to validate that all your information got over there properly before you um, start working on, on, on your case right for forensics. Validating evidence may be the most critical aspect of computer forensics, requiring the use of a hashing algorithm. So validation is CRC32, MD5, SHA1 to SHA520. Basically what a hash is, is whatever disk is on, whatever information is on that disk, when I hash it, it creates a hundred byte number for that exact everything on that disk. All right. So then when I copy it, when I hash the new disk I copied, those numbers should be the same. If I change one byte of information and I rehash it, the hash and number is going to be different. Um, I'm usually an MD5 um, guy. Most people always talk about MD5 is hacked. I'm like, I'm not doing it for encryption to uh, hide or obfuscate information. I'm doing MD5 because I just want to make sure those data is in the same drive match, right? So that's what I actually use it for from, from, a, from a hashing perspective. And like I said, those are the um, big two. So what Engineering Cannabis says about hashing. Oh, yeah, there's probably 100 hash. You were correct. Um, like I said, I'm usually an MD5 or SHA-256. Uh, but, but no, engineering, is, engineering Cannabis is correct. It's at least, I know, 50 or 60. Um, if you ever studied for the CI, CISP test, which I have done before, I did not pass a decade ago, but I think I missed about six questions, but we went over about 20 hashing algorithms in there. So uh, engineering cannabis is correct. Black, oh, and blockchain, SHA-5 is the most popular. That's cool. Like I said, I usually do SHA-256 or MD-5. So uh, Linux validating method, uh, validate DD to acquire. Uh, like we talked about, you can use uh, MD5 sum or SHA-1 sum utilities. Uh, MD5 SHA-1 utilities should be run on all at suspect drives and volumes or segmented volumes, right? Anyway, you, those uh, data is divided up in the uh, drive. You want to make sure you get a hash on that because when you put them on a new drive, you want to check the volumes, um, directories segmented volumes and to, and if it's actually the pst i'll take a hash of the individual psts especially if i think that's where the harassment email or the, the things that call the issue right so i want to make sure uh nothing can be said that we mess with that data or something happened to it right validating dc fee acquired we talked about that you can use the hash options detonating the hash algorithm MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-385, or SHA-512. In the hash log option, I'll put hash results to a text file that can be stored with the image file. So you want to put those hash files out there so you can show that none, once again, on there was tampering. I use verify a lot, compares the image of a file to the original medium. Uh, when I used to work with a lot of pay files and bank files and uh files we send to get people paid, I always want to verify the compare. Because when I spin out, I'm going to make an image to send to the bank. I just want to make sure nothing's uh, corrupt with the image. So that was part of my automation process, right? Hash it to make sure it hasn't been changed. And part of that, make sure when we SFTP it, nothing got corrupted. And the verify says that that image file is still good, right? I tell people, you can play with me with a lot of things, but my money is not one of them, right? So... Uh, but once again, we just want to make sure we verify those files. Once again, that else was uh, in the Windows validation. Windows has no built-in hash algorithms for tools, computer forensics. But there's a bunch of third-party tools. Commercial computer forensic programs are also has built-in validation tools. Each program has their own validation. We talked about Live CD as one. Um, Cali has a ton of that in there is too if you're using a part of Cali. So once again in Windows, there's a ton of <clears throat> commercially available uh files out there. The raw for the raw format uh, image file does not contain metadata. 
Separate manual validation is recommended for our raw acquisitions. So let's talk about the raids. Performing raid data acquisition. Acquisition of raid drives can be challenging and frustrating because how raid systems are designed, configured, and sized. Size is the biggest concern. Any raid system now has an exabyte of data, right? So uh, we're jumping array, but yeah, that's why you use Ray because if one of those drives crash, it'll rebuild itself, even though it's humongous. Cybersecurity, do you really need to understand these algorithms such as hash and also cryptography to be an expert, essentially, if you want to improve processes like Kubernetes? Uh, my, no, I don't think you do from a... Um, no, from a cryptography algorithm, you, you, you're you 100% right, cannabis, especially from a federal level. They tell us what to to do, and they have, um, it's called FITS 140-2. That's a government-improved encryption. So if you go look at this website, it tells you if you can use that. And we're going to talk about RAID and databases. It tells you which databases, what RAID types, and even what file types you can use because it needs to meet that that government requirement of a uh, FIS 140-2. So you're 100% right. Um, that's why I'm kind of talk of, talking about it at a high level. Because you're right. I'm just going to use the hash and it's going to hash, right? Do I, or if I'm going to use an AES-256, you know, it's 16 rounds of seed binary data. Do I really need to know that, uh, engineer? Kind of, no, right? I just need to know it's approved by the government on a FIS 140-2 list. So you are correct, engineer. That's why we're touching about, you know, when we do these school type of stuff, we got to touch on some stuff high level, even though we won't we won't need it. Right. So. So once again, redundant rate is redundant array array of independent disks. Computers configure evolving two or more disks originally developed as a data redundancy measure. Rate zero provides rapid access and increased storage. Biggest disadvantage is lack of redundancy. Um, RAID 1 is designed for data recovery and most expensive, uh, more expensive than RAID 0. So this is RAID 0 where you're copying it on two different disks. So if one disk is uh, going down, it's actually split, right, for striping. So that's RAID 0. Let me show you the slide at the bottom. If you go back and look at my cybersecurity, we delved a little deeper into that RAID, right? The other uh, is mirroring, right? Uh, which is splitting on two different drives, which is RAID one is mirroring. So instead of half the drive, right? That's the whole the whole file, right? So if this disk goes down, I can go get this whole file from disk two, right? I won't lose anything. Let's see. Anybody heard of EB5 Visa? I have not, Boyles. I'm not going to lie. I have never heard of EB5 Visa. Um, I have not. So similar to RAID 2 is similar to RAID 1. Data is written to a disk on a big level. It has uh, better data integrity than RAID 0, but it's slower than RAID 0. RAID 3 uses data striping and dedicated parity. requires at least three disks. Similar to RAID 3, RAID 4, a data is written in blocks, right? So I think we, so this is RAID 2 with bit level striping. So at the top, you see that bit level on parity. So if one of these disks goes down, I can recreate it with the parity and the other disk to recreate it. That's bit level. So once again, there's a lot of RAID. RAID 5 is places the parity recover data on each disk. RAID 6 is redundant parity on each disk. RAID 10 is 0 plus 1. You got a mirror striping plus uh, RAID 1 striping. And RAID 5 is, once again, RAID 1 and 5 together. It's the most costly. I've never seen RAID 15 in, in, in real life. Right. So I think they got a couple breakdowns. This is RAID 5 on blocking. So it shows you the, the parity bit, the copy of that, and the parity disk at, at the bottom, right? So if you lose, I believe, two of these disks, they would get rebuilt because the parity 
and the uh, data is copied on another disk so you can spice them again and rebuild your hunter. ftk simulator Ooh, i gotta look into that wilton um i <laughs> i had one when, when i when i the university has one i think they paid a lot of money for it wilton i gotta look at it and see if, if there's an open source version of that um like i said i we had a copy of it i think it was kind of pricey if i remember correct like i said when you're at the university the university has a, a lot of that right so i i will see if there i would google um open source version of that of the ftk wilton and see if that if that exists so how do you acquire those raids how much data is needed what type of raid? do you need to have all the drafts connected do you have the right acquisition tool can the tool reads forensically copy raid images can the tool resplit split data saved on each individual raid disk copy small array system to one large disk is possible so once again it depends on the raid and the disk and a lot of times you know those are those are huge You move out to a bit too forbidden for your system, and it's fine. Cool. <laughs> you can remotely connect to a suspect computer via network connection and copy the data from it. All right, you know, there's um, RDP, which is not secure from a Windows perspective. Uh, there's, I wouldn't say not secure, but there's a lot of problems issue uh, when, you know, you can SSH into a ton of boxes, uh, depending on how they are. You can mount the drives, um, databases. You can use uh, TNS to copy data between them. There's a lot of tools out there. Acquis acquisition tools vary in configuration capabilities. The drawback, of course, antivirus, anti-spyware, firewall tools can be configured to ignore remote access. Uh, suspects could easily install their own security tools that trigger an alarm and notify them of remote access intrusion. Oh, that's true, but a lot of times too is um, those are corporate owned assets, so we can control them. So since they're owned by corporations, we can um, cut off anything that they installed on there. And a lot of times too is, um, to be honest, um, when they do an investigation on people, they usually take their laptop or uh, install and Install, install other software on there to block their their tools that they try to install right so that, that's common so pro discovered is another tool out there for instant response functions it's captured volatility system state information analyze currently uh, running processes locate unforeseen files and processes remote view listening to ip reports uh, like we talked about, run your hash comparison and create a hash inventory of all the files remotely, which is cool because that doesn't mean we don't have to uh, take their equipment uh, right away. What's up, CKC Entertainment? Uh, salute. Um, and so the two things in there a lot of times is uh, when you run in volatile state information, that's only going to be there for a certain amount of time. So if you SFTP files and you want to track them, uh, Unless you're doing a log file, a lot of stuff is going to be in the process state of the table, right, in the programs. And as more programs run, it's going to push that stuff off the stack, right? So you want to make sure you can get that information and export it or pipe it to a, a log file or something. <laughs> What's up? We on low now. <laughs> Yeah, I got to get it together, man. Uh, part of the pro disk uh, servers, uh, PD servers, a remote agent utility for remote access needs to be loaded on the suspect computer. PD server installation mode, trust the CD, pre-installation, push out and run remotely. PD servers can run in stealth mode, uh, can change process name to appear as OS function, right? So that's the stuff you use when you don't want to know people know that you're working on their machine and that they're under investigation. Right? Uh, most times we just state, we call it a uh, company on equipment. We just don't take it. Right. You just got to sit tight as part of that. Right. But so. And also pro discovery, you've got remote connections for security uh, features. 
password protection, encryption, secure communication protocol, right, protected trusted binaries and digital signatures. Once again, you want to protect it because you're looking over the network. You're pulling information. You don't want people <laughs> looking at the information you're looking at because it's not encrypted or you don't want uh, people to, to hack it while it's not in there. So loop B2B. So once again, we just touched on the high points of digital forensics, different programs. Uh, we'll look out there because sometimes they have free versions of that. Um, I'll check and see which we used to have. I don't I don't know if I can get them. We used to have uh, coupons to get some of these at a uh, discounted rate for students. Um, in case it's the 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 Cisco of uh, forensic stuff. That's the big one. All the big guys use. Um, so that's the one we'll talk about. That's super specific. Okay, I'm off phone call. I'm going to look up on Joey Sun. I appreciate it for joining me. Check out my novice security, breaking it down at a lower level. So I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for that. My dad was over here helping me pay my room. I'm listening. Oh, that's cool, man. Shout out to getting it together, man. I need to do some touch up on my house. I haven't done anything to my house in a long time. So I need to freshen that up myself on that level. Shout out to B2B, go check him out. We're gonna do some joint uh, data lake stuff, data warehousing stuff, probably a few programming from a uh, data engineer. Um, so once again, remote acquisition, this is in case, this is the big daddy, search and collect internal, external information of your networks of a wide geographical area. It supports multiple OSs and file systems. You can triage help determine system relevance, uh, relevance to an investigation, perform simultaneous searches for up to five systems at a time, right? Because when you're doing um, forensics from a large organization, you being hacked, right? So sometimes uh, you're trying to figure out what's going on, what information you need to copy, what information went out, right? And a lot of times too, from a forensic standpoint, we're not trying to catch the bad guy. We're trying to figure out what the bad guy did, right? And a lot of times, too, is um, you got to look in log files. You got to look in people's email if it's harassment, right? So depending on the forensics analysis you're doing, of course, like anything, it's going to figure uh, help you with figuring out what tool set you need to do. In case you can do it all, <laughs> right? So uh remote acquisition of our tools in our studio it's a, a suite of once again software designed for data recovery can remotely access network computer systems create a raw format support various files so once again there's a lot of tools in there so we're just touching on the high level uh tools and you would check them out and too it depends on the company you're going to that's going to run these tools once again this is the wet uh stone us lateral core same thing, part of a suite of tools developed by them can be connected to a network computer and perform a live acquisition of all your uh, drives and connected to. Uh, this is after response. I'm just kind of floating through them now. Forensic acquisition tool. So in the future, of course, we will get a couple of these tools and it would actually run them in the lab and just kind of test them out. Uh, make a copy of your... Uh, your laptop or whatever you're working on, put it on a thumb drive and just kind of dig into it and, and look at it. Right? These are other commercial acquisition tools, PassMark, IRS Data Smart, Runtime, iLook, iX Investigator, iX Manage, of course, that's for Apple. SourceForge has a ton of stuff out there, which is uh, open source. Um, be careful out there. <laughs> Some of things have viruses and malware on it too. All right, so the uh, PassMark software, acquisition tools, OS forensic analysis. You can create a bootable flash drive for Windows, uh, XP or later. Obviously that's slow, <laughs> that slide is up. Image USB download from the OS forensic website. This is the capabilities, the IRS data smart. Um, I like it because it's a Linux forensic analysis tool that can make image files, can produce a proprietary raw format images, capabilities, read data, Data reading of bad sectors can mount drives and write protected mode.
can mount target drives and rewrite modes, compress schemes to speed up the acquisition run. I need to look out there, to be honest. Uh, I haven't been out there at SKC. I, I, I was, they've been around for forever. This slide could be old. These slides are old, SKC. I need to double check that one now that you mention it. I need to check that. Uh, once again, uh, runtime, software, shareware, disk for file and NTFS. Is, those are Microsoft uh, file formats. You could create a raw image, sex the raw format, a compressed image, access the network, computer drives. <laughs> Uh, the IXI manage bootable floppy CDs, design only work with their stuff, can acquire single drives and RAID drives. Uh, it supports uh, IDE, SCSI, USB, and Firewire. So I know I haven't heard it. It's been a long time. I need to go look out there too, <laughs> CKC. I need to go look out. It's been a, It's probably been longer than that for me for SourceForge. I just don't do open source like that anymore, man. Unless I'm unless I'm on it, right? So that's the uh source forge tool. Now I gotta go out there and look at it. <laughs> Let's see what we get. I was still out there. That's KC. Okay. It came up. So I don't know, still a lot. I'm showing a picture of an SKC. We we still kicking it on SourceForge. I, I was like you on there. It's been a minute since I've been out there. There's a lot of good stuff out there, though. Hands-on patch manager, agile, uh, Windows. So yeah, they, they got some stuff. stuff. So yeah, it's still out there, CKC. I was with you on there. So I clicked. It came up, man. It's, SourceForge is still kicking strong. So I, I was surprised. So um JM, did you want me to uh, delve into uh, containers a little bit? I think Tam clicked on. If you uh, go into my um, videos on my uh, YouTube site and do containers, I did one on uh, Docker. I did one on um, Kubernetes, and I did one on both of them in uh, AWS and how they operate in AWS, uh, JM. So go check those out. Um they're in my videos. If not, reach out to me. I, I'll send you the links if you can't find them. I don't know. Like I said, I've I probably done four hours on containers. Uh, once again, I'm a security analyst in real life, and a lot of people are deploying stuff to containers, especially um, Kubernetes seems to be getting a little hotter than Docker recently. I'm a Docker guy because I do Java, so I was going to use, uh, I think it's a CKS in AWS. So they got Docker's that are already managed in AWS. So I was going to deploy. A, okay, yeah, just go out there. Then once you check those videos out, JM, then we can chop it up. Um, then once we um, um, uh, deploy that, uh, AWS will manage the Kubernetes or the Docker. It, I think it's called Fargate. It actually, AWS Fargate would actually manage both of those uh, containers for you. I'm trying to get more fluent in in the um, AWS world. That's actually the new um, cloud. I won't call it new. I'm late. So um, yeah, here it goes. Yeah, Fargate. Uh, serverless compute for containers. Um, you can deploy and manage your acquisition. Fargate removes the operational overhead of scaling, patching, and securing those managed servers. You can both do Amazon e, uh, ECS, which is Docker. Amazon EKS is the Kubernetes. So with Fargate, it, it'll manage both of those containers for you, JM. Um, oh, Tam's back in the house. Check those videos out. Oh, let me drop the link while I'm chit-chatting if anybody want to come up. Like I said, I'll... I'm still recovering from towns five hours then i was on uh citizen lou um so shout out to the uh fargate i don't know if tams uses fargate um does the tails distribution linux can help protect you from all those forensic techniques professor can the tail distribution can help protect you from all yeah i mean tails gonna um what do you mean by protect? Because Tails is just going to show you the last 25 in the file. So it, it, it'll show you if it's encrypted. It'll show you if it can read the file from that perspective. What's up, NC worker? Uh, Tim, what's your thoughts on uh, Fargate? Have you ever used Fargate? You know, I've been studying for the uh, 
practitioner. I'm just so busy. I, my study is not going well. So, uh, but I've been, like I said, I've been um, learning about new, new things on um, AWS, and I was surprised with Fargate kind of manages both of those for you. Um, like I said, I'll probably check it out. I'm I'm starting with the basics. I'm gonna set up a, a VPC and set up a super easy uh, VPC and a one AZ. Set up a three tier um, data architect as a lab. Hopefully, gonna run that sometime this weekend as a lab and walk it through with people. Um, so that that's my that's my hope this weekend. I had a huge um, on site audit from Booz Allen, one of the big boys, and we we did pretty good. So I was gonna talk about that at a high level. What the federal audit looks like uh, from GRC uh, governance risk and compliance standpoint. What does that look like? Uh, how does it kick off? What do they do in the middle? What are they looking for? How are they grading your organization on uh, SDLC, system development lifecycle? Uh, what questions are they asking you to do that? Uh, people setting up my scale. <laughs> I'm not messing with your scale, Tam. I told you that. <laughs> Shout out to Tam. I don't want no BMI check on <laughs> PBO. don't want no BMI checks. He, he got to get in <laughs> I'm going to go walking after this. I done, I've been sitting down a whole pandemic eating steak. I got to get it together. Man. So I dropped the link. If anybody want to come up, cool. If anybody got any questions, cool. Professor Black Ops at uh, gmail.com. I usually try to answer all my emails in 48 hours. That's what they make us do at school. But I've been slacking on my on my email. Tim, what you said you're not... Um, Slacking today, you taking a day off? Not slacking, but in your Slack group, that is time. You're not slacking in your Slack group today. You off today, Tim? Mm. So yeah, that's one of the. Uh, like I said, I've been checking out Fargate, and I, let me see. I think Tim's. This, did I saw? Yeah, Control Tower. Mm. I I. I'm going to do control tower time. I got to learn the individual pieces. There was so much in control towers overwhelming. So that's why I kind of start doing them a little individually. I slack every day. <laughs> Facts. So, um, so like I said, that's all I got. Uh, I'm just not holding the rust. Okay, cool. You're not holding your rust class today. What does you do? Do you usually do your rust class on a Sunday at four? <clears throat> I was thinking about teaching a Java class, but it's just so old, man. I think everybody go check out Tim's Rust class. So. Everybody have a happy Sunday. Okay. It's just a programming language. What's up, Black Dub? We just finished it up, man. You're going to have to check the replay. <laughs> hey, how you doing, man? Shout out to you. What's the Slack group called? Uh, just do women in Linux. It came up when I did women in Linux. I think they're the she's. I think they're the first Slack group I, I joined. There's just so many uh, Slack groups and uh, Discord groups. And no, you good. You good. You you are all good. Black Duck. I know you be supporting me and checking me out. <laughs> it's all good. So yeah. So um. So yeah, I'm great. Brush up on my job. Like I said, I was gonna use um, uh, not the container. I was gonna use the um, Beanstalk inside AWS. Um, I wouldn't cut. That's container ish ish, but it has time kind of stuff built in it. It makes it easier for people to um, uh, if you're doing Java, C sharp, you can just drop it into their um. Uh, it's either gonna be Apache or Time. Can they have it pre set up so you can drop your um code in there and it'll run and support it it'll manage it it uh um, if you need a server it'll spin up another server for you so i'm gonna start off with being stopped i said tim wore me out yesterday at five hours man I'm, I'm still a little i'm about to take a nap probably <laughs> five hours killed me yesterday so i want to thank everybody for joining me um like i said we just touched in on forensic because at a high level just once again i like to touch on different domains in cybersecurity because it, it, it's so big and i'm sure me and tim will do some join on DevSecOps because that's um it's, i compared to what i'm teaching that's really new but DevSec DevOps has been out for a while so 
Um, I think um, I would call it, yes, yeah, a skill set is something you need, and there's a lot of things that you need to know to build up to be a good DevSecOps person. A lot of stuff I've done on prem, I just got to get used to doing that in the cloud uh, from that perspective and automation, you know. Um, I, I'm old. I use Corn Shell, so I got to use uh, Ansible. Um, uh, I know Tam's big. Ter she's big on Terraform. I'm trying to do AWS, so I've been checking out their cloud formation. But they're a lot of different automation tools, and they're used for for different things. Once again, so trying to, like they said on there, figure the right tool for the right job, so you can get the right bag. <laughs> That's gonna be my list. the right tool, the right job for the right bag, right? So. That's all I got, everybody. Everybody have a, a nice weekend. I just want to do something short on um, forensics, my class, um, uh, my YouTube class I do on Sunday at 3. So I just want to be consistently. Um, Mr. Uh, everybody go subscribe to everybody. Uh, Women in Linux is doing good things. Uh, I'm just always surprised why they're not uh, bigger, um, all the information they give out. So go check them out. Uh, I know Engineering Cannabis is getting his channel. I think uh, AI and me. So uh, I know he's getting that up. So we're going to support him when they get in there. Uh, B2B, I like hanging out with young people because I'm old. So go check out Before the Billions. He gives out great information. I'm staying off his red pill <laughs> relationships. That's not for old people. Shout out to uh, B2B. He's giving out great information. Man. And, uh, shout out to his dad if he's in the room. Man, he's... Uh, a great role model and, and uh, raised a great young man. I'm not, uh, you know, I just like to see young people keep it popping. I just like to see, you know, young people doing things that are positive with all the, the negative things we see in there. That's because I talk about two facts. <laughs> keep it popping. So, yeah, go see Tam because she's talking about uh, accredited, accredited investor jobs or money, which is over 200K. And up to two million jobs. I mean, she, I, I, she kind of got challenged, so she was uh, drinking her water and pulling up receipts yesterday. So um, she doesn't need my support, but you know, I always got her back. Um, this is we're not capping. We're, we're not overestimating. We know this is not for everybody, and everybody's gonna not make two hundred k. But if you put in the work, put in the time, there's out there for you to get it right. Um, I've been in the game for a long time. I, I can't tell my exact salary, but I can see accreditation money. I, I, I can see it. <laughs> so I know it's out there to get. So I just won't help people get it. Yeah, yeah like my tech family. Y'all, facts, Black Dub, we're here to support you and to help. And that's that's one reason I came out. You know, <laughs> it was such facts. Um, <laughs> no lies. So that's it. So. Uh, once again, uh, check out Women in Linux. And I, I'm going to be partnering with a lot of people. I keep saying that. Check out my man before the billions. Um, uh, Black Heights, Tech G. I mean, there's so many great people in there. Uh, textual Chatter. Uh, there's a uh, Textual Chatter. Uh, um, Network Bruh, if you're in the networking. A lot of people like to get their CNA, uh, Network Plus. Um, check out Network Bruh, in Network B-R-U-H. I'm just trying to go through the list. So, like I said, those are some of the people I work with. I'm just focusing on IT. I'm not focusing on anything else. I'm not I'm not jumping into any of that extra stuff <laughs> that's out here. I'm just focusing on tech and getting this bag and just talking about, um, like Tim said, how to get the bag doing lives, just doing work, man. Uh, I'm about to start studying for my um, AWS practitioner chest. Um, just uh, knocking the dust off. So even at 53, I got to study. I got to get some new skills because, you know, um, I did a thing on ageism, but a lot of times it's not ageism. Your skills are just old, so you got to keep your skills up. So even at 53, I have to get new skills because I, I got another... 12, 15 years in IT, hopefully 10, I'm going to retire early. But, you know, you got to keep your skills up so Tim can help me get that real money, right? So you got to put in work. So I'll be um, going over some AWS stuff uh, once again. I, and I'll do a lab and probably do a lab on my, um, my channel later on this week. That's all I got. Everybody have a great weekend. I'm out. Um, 
Be safe. Monday's here, and I'm tired already. <laughs> I see everybody on these YouTube streets.